Are you in a band? Are you an entertainment entrepreneur? Are you a musician, a songwriter, or producer? Or are you wanting to start a career in the music industry? If so, then this podcast is for you. On the Do That Music Thing podcast, we'll be interviewing subject matter experts, artists, and other leaders in the music industry to identify actionable strategies to move you forward in your career, spark some inspiration, and at the least just have some fun talking about music. So let's get to it and do that music thing. And now a quick word from our sponsors. We all know the music business ain't easy, but it is simple. Learn exactly how simple making a plan can be from the connector, Chris Keaton. This award-winning song plugger, management consultant, recording academy, and North Carolina Music Hall of Fame member can help you move the needle on your career. Email chris at chriskeaton.com or visit his website at www.chriskeaton.com for more information. And now, back to the show. Hello and welcome to another awesome episode of the Do That Music Thing podcast, where we are talking with anyone and everyone in the music industry, from artists to label executives to managers, people making moves, people making change, and moving their career forward in the music industry. And today I have an amazing guest, an incredibly talented recording artist, influenced heavily from jazz legends to Bill Withers to the Beatles. Let's give it up for Garrett Thorne. Garrett, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. How you doing? Good, man. Thank you for having me. It's nice to uh, meet you here in this fashion. <laughs> Absolutely. So Garrett, tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah. Okay. So um, I am uh, just a musician from uh, Wisconsin originally. I was uh, I would gig and play up um, all over the state and all over the area, moved down to Nashville in 2015. And um, I just really, really appreciate uh, original music and art and uh, of all types. So I wanted to get somewhere closer to uh, an epicenter of that nature. Got down here and now uh, I write my own tunes and go out and play all types of gigs from festivals to little acoustic gigs, just depending on whatever I get called for. And I love that you describe yourself as a recording artist. Explain to me why you have described yourself that way. Yeah, that so that was my the recording process is is one of my favorite, if not my favorite part of music. Um, just being like you said in the intro, like a huge Beatles fan, they stopped touring and pretty much focused on recording when in the first band I was in when we were, I was like in seventh or eighth grade, I think. And we used to hang just SM or uh, yeah, SM sure 50, uh, 58 just from like the middle of the ceiling, just hang like one of them and try to play like a three or four piece band and capture the moments. And it would sound awful. And we're like, why does it sound so bad? Like <laughs> how do these guys do it? So I've always kind of been fascinated with that process and just the recording piece of everything is uh, my favorite. I think it's hard. It's hard, but it's fun. It's super fun. It's so much fun. And I don't think that that's one problem that I have, I think, with the only problem I really have with the democratization of recording equipment and DAWs. Everyone has a recording studio at home. Clearly, I do. Uh, and I love making music. But you get in this kind of repetitive nature. It's easy to fall into the trap of just get it done and not experiment. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that the Beatles... And a lot of groups from that era did really well was experimenting. So are, how are you experimenting and use, utilizing some of those techniques and that creative mindset in your recordings? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I did a bunch of sessions. I am just finished tracking a whole album and I'm going to, uh, I'll be releasing it this year. But there was a couple tunes that I had that were more of a traditional process that were like scripted and we kind of had rehearsed it. It was the, uh, the songs were structured in a, maybe a little bit more of a traditional pop format, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, solo kind of thing. Um, there was a couple tunes where I wanted to, so I was a science teacher back in the day and I wanted to like literally take a stab at putting chaos into the recording. And so I was like, at this point in the, in the song, we'll do a verse, chorus, verse, chorus. And then we're not talking about it we're just, this is where we end. And I like showed them the structure of the ending. And I was like, we need to just 
keep eye contact with each other and see what happens. And we recorded it live and just what it was is what we played in the room right then. We didn't really get a chance to like finagle things, which was cool. And then another tune we uh, just drummed up from the ground up in the session. It was uh, there was a little bit of extra time and it was an instrumental tune the very last song on the album, but we were just messing around and trying. That's where I find most of the, the coolest ideas happen is when it's just like a bit of a pressure cooker. Like we have this many hours left in the session and we have this one idea. And if we just run with it, sometimes good things happen. Sometimes not, <laughs> sometimes it's bad, but also I think those, uh, yeah, just taking chances is a good thing taking those chances in a live setting in a recording studio is absolute magic. I think that you listen to a lot of those incredible, legendary, epic recordings that a lot of people like us hold so dear. Those were recorded live in the same room. I mean, arguably to like two to four tracks, right? You know, you've got yeah. one mic for the vocals and you've got one mic over the drums. So it's a, it's a really incredible thing. And I, I've had the, opportunity to record live in a in a studio as well and when you are doing a traditional tracking session right where we're gonna lay the drums down now we're gonna lay the bass down now mm -hmm. we're gonna lay the guitar down. there's nothing wrong with that and the control that you get is pretty amazing but when you're all in the same room at the same time in that energy and you can just see each other's faces and just get into the moment it, it's hard to beat it is it is it feels really really good too because I, I think that's what makes those old records have so much more vibe just because of like, not everything is able to be lined up perfectly. And oh gosh, there was a couple, there's one song on the, the record that it's a duet and the, my duet partner and I, we sang it on the same mic and the same take. And my producer or like the mix engineers got, they just like roll their eyes. I'm like, we're leaving it. Like we're not, we could recut it, but he's just like, but this is hard to mix. And I was like, exactly. Like it shouldn't be just easy. Cause then it's just, it can sound like other things then. And, uh, but who knows? Sometimes those things, sometimes I just get too crazy with ideas, which is fine. Yeah, no, should... no, no, never, never. No such thing is too crazy when it comes to recording. Uh, you hear the stories though, like, you know, the, when the levee breaks by Led Zeppelin, yeah. right? You know, recording a room mic from the top of the stairwell with one microphone mm -hmm. or um, what is it? There's a Motley Crue record where you hear this incredible noise that you think is a weird snare drum, but it's a brake caliper they brought in. They were hitting it with a hammer. So, <laughs> like who thought of that? I mean, it's amazing. Um, yeah. but it's, it's so much fun. Let's talk a little bit about this new record of yours. So, Let's talk about the writing process, a little bit more about the recording process, and then what are plans for its release? Cool. Um, yeah, so the writing process, they're mostly tunes that I had written over the past three years. Um, and I, I just kind of been through a bunch of crazy situations over the past three years. My, uh, my wife's parents were both uh, killed, actually on a, they were walking on a sidewalk on a vacation and they, uh, a car accident happened next to them. And her dad was a musician. So uh, this is actually, this acoustic is his guitar. And I tra I wrote most of the tunes on that guitar. And then I played um, all of my parts. I, I, I play a lot of electric, obviously, but the two, um, or the whole album I played acoustic on, I played his instruments. And then um, he was also a big Beatles fan. So I tried to inject like the Beatles and a little bit of uh, his sounds for that. And so th that was, it was a very like cathartic process because as we were kind of dealing with all of that, uh, just like the tragedy of everything, it was like a nice place to put my consciousness into bringing something up that actually was like keeping me sane. And it was like a, a just a healthy output in a way. So that was the writing, that was the writing process. And then with the recording process, um, we got, I have a good number of people and, uh, friends in my, uh, circle here that I jam with or, or tour with or record with, and I wanted to get as many people, um, in collaboration on it as I could. So we had, I kind of formed like a little just quasi band for this 
um, situation. It was a five piece. We had uh, drums, uh, my acoustic, I had an electric guitar player, a bassist, and then um, a keys player. I, I just watched that, the whole uh, get back thing, uh, docu-series, and I was super inspired by that whole process of just seeing all that album come to life. So um, we kind of did, I wanted to take as much of that as I could and try to put it into uh, the tunes in the process itself. Um, so we rehearsed and then played a few gigs out of town. Um, I, I'm really into how comedians make things. So road testing is re- very important to me. Like I'll, if I'll make songs and then I'll also, like I, most of the time I don't go into a studio session without going at, into um, like just a few live settings to see how things go. Cause I'm, I'm almost always surprised. Like the way that I think things will go from the song's sonic perspective is not what I, it, it's just not how it goes. Like the things that I like are the things that I'm like, this part will be the part that everybody digs or the most fun song. Just not how very rarely is, am I right on that? So I think that's kind of a good piece of the road uh, testing. And then for the release, it's in the process of getting mixed as we speak. Uh, so very pumped about that. And that part is harder than you would think too. Like, I think a lot of listeners, especially like non-musicians who just consume music, they don't understand how tricky the whole process is to make like three minutes of noise and, and to make it sound smooth and good. And um, so that's, uh, I'm in the middle of that. And then I think this summer um, is what I'm aiming for, for a release. Um, hopefully June, June was the original target, but um, as soon as it's done, I'll um, be releasing singles and then the whole thing eventually. Awesome. Yeah. The mixing piece is incredibly tricky. I mean, you hit the nail on the head with that. It's trying to fit one mile of sounds into two feet of space. Yeah, it is. I describe it always as um, like when you go to a concert or go to a show, it's a room and it's a, the band is laid out on a stage and there's like a three dimensional element to it. And you're trying to create a three dimensional feeling in a two dimensional uh, experience with like the audio listening thing. So it, it, that's, that's very hard to do, but that's why they get, you find great mix engineers and they just know how to do that. Yeah. And especially the ones that take cues from, I think the sixties and seventies and take those, those, techniques but do it in a modern sense yeah Um, like the whole wall of sound concept um i that's how i consume music and that's how i like to hear music so when i mix music i i kind of mix it as if i were sitting in front of the band where yeah you know the kick drum is directly in the center snare drum is slightly off to the right hi-hat's a little bit further right than that overheads kind of exist across the center, you know, bass is up the middle. You've got a guitar on the far right, guitar on the far left. Um, and it creates a really immersive experience. And I don't feel like enough people do that enough now, at least in modern commercial music. Absolutely. I, I agree. I like, I think like George Martin and with the Beatles, nowadays we kind of view a lot of those strategies as like incorrect quote unquote, not that there's anything correct ever about music, but I think that creates a lot of space. Sometimes they used, they would pan things hard, right. And hard left. And it is, a, it's just not as proper in today's world, but also I think just because they really didn't know. And sometimes it created better mixes when I listen now, even on uh, headphones, it it is interesting. I wish more people would do that um, just because it's, not as a uh, typical right now. Well, it's a lot easier to identify instruments and players. Um, one thing I love about a lot of jazz records is a, they're all live, right? Yeah. But they're so well mixed because I think they're so well placed. So uh-huh. I, I know the guitar is going to be like right here. And I know the bass, the stand up bass is going to be right here. Trumpet's going to be up here somewhere. Um, and it's cool because you can identify right so when you go listen to beatles recordings or cream records or you know any of those 60s late 60s rock records 
you know where the that specific player is going to be in the mix and you can Absolutely. listen to just them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, and that yeah and their identity comes out as the player which to me is very important because that is the reason why you kind of hire certain people or work with certain people at all is they're like what they can do on their instrument and yeah the Beatles are a good example of those the way that those things work together can actually like make the song just as much as a lyric or a, a vocal performance can like it's the that marriage of everything is a lot of the times it's a uh, might not be what you pay attention to initially but it, it it is my favorite part of music for sure so you mentioned that you watched the Get Back docuseries, which yeah. is A, incredible. But you, do you, you have a... It? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I watched it. I think I've seen it twice now. I know. Yeah. And I'm not a Beatles f super fan. I appreciate the Beatles. Do I prefer their solo work a little more? Yeah. But, you know, to each his own. Yeah. Um, but that documentary, I also have a, a soft spot for music documentaries. And that's what I wanted to ask you is like, what is your favorite music documentary? Oh man, I've got a, I, I'm also a pretty big, uh, music documentary junkie. I, so that one was really, really good. That one isn't shot like most other music docs where they like, there's hours of footage where you're like, are these guys just like mad, like going ham in the studio with each other and that that there was an like a ridiculous amount of playtime in the studio for them which i guess that's what happens when you're the beatles but um <laughs> <laughs> i love did you watch that uh the documentary on the eagles by chance oh the 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 long one the very long one there's uh, on the, yeah, the one that's yeah. like like eight hours long yes that yes. one was really really good too because it i didn't realize their story is very interesting of like how many connections they had with from when they were talking about their relationship with Bob Seger and Linda Ronstadt and all these, the uh, even Kenny Rogers was in it. So like all the different uh, like who they touched and crossed paths with over their career was really good. The Tom Petty documentary was really good. I watched one on Bill Withers that was not as popular. I actually, I think I found it somewhere like in the like bowels of the internet, but it was uh that one was super cool because he was just like a little bit more behind the scenes kind of a character I think in general and so to see him who he was who he was as a person and what he was like um was cool I I guess there's another one that was very interesting about the um the the oh what's the name of that place it's that uh valley in LA where the singer songwriters and the folk movement happened in the Yes. Because yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one was cool. Yeah. That one, the, all of them are good. I'm also a sucker. What, what's your favorite? Gosh. Uh, I love Muscle Shoals. Yeah. Um, okay. I haven't seen that one. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, if you're a Beatles fan, I don't know, you might love it or hate it. Um, because they do a pretty awesome section on Wilson Pickett recording Hey Jude. Hey Jude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With, uh, Dwayne Allman on guitar because he was the session guitarist there for a little while and I remember the first time I heard that version of Hey Jude and I cried when he yeah. hit that when he hits the breakdown the na 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 that section Wilson just lets out the most just like gut wrenching like wow I mean and it yeah. it just made me cry it was a, a, a spiritual moment but um, I love Muscle Shoals I love the Foo Fighters back mm -hmm. and forth. Yeah. Uh, I loved Sound City. That was a really cool documentary on the recording studio. Um, and there was one more that I, I like adore. Oh, Dig. If you haven't seen Dig, I, I highly recommend it. it. It's mid-90s. It follows the Dandy Warhols and the Brian Jonestown Massacre. Oh, okay. And it follows their kind of trajectory, how the Dandy Warhol has exploded and Brian Jonestown just kind of like, not faded, but, you know, follows, I forget the lead singer's name of that group or the, the primary artist in that group, but um, it follows his kind of mental health challenges, but it's exceptional. Um, cool. And it's, 
he was one of those people I think that could just go in and record an album like just by himself, you know, very much like a, I wouldn't compare him to Prince, but you know how Prince could just wake up one morning and be like, Hey, I'm going to go record an incredibly legendary Epic album today by myself, you Play know, everything. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but those are probably my, my, my big favorite documentaries. I'll check out that dig one. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. It's absolutely bonkers. Um, so let's go back to talking about the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So, What's your favorite Beatles record and why? Oh man, okay. I love Abbey Road a lot. I was not a big fan of the early Beatles. Like from second half is probably my favorite. When they got to like Rubber Soul is when I really started vibing with them. I had gotten a um, just a couple albums of theirs when I was a kid. And the first half felt like very boy bandy to me. And once they got into the more like experimental side of things, that's when I got into them. But I would say Abbey Road because they were starting to peak or they, they were like in the middle of the peak and like for them to stop right there, it's like a movie. It's like a Quentin Tarantino movie for their career. Like you're just, it's like this long, crazy career that they put out all this stuff. And then all of a sudden it's like just done, but, um, and it doesn't end exactly how you expect. So come together is like an incredible performance and it's just like a bluesy number the, the comp compilation i think of everything on there george harrison was hitting his peak with here comes the sun and i think something is on that album as well so he had something and here comes the sun and then um yeah like the whole everybody's songwriting i think was getting to be uh, was peaking even though I don't think they were like getting along that well and there but maybe that's the reason why it was so good too is just because they could do the recording very well and uh, the writing process itself but um, maybe not they didn't have the friend thing down as much at that point in time and plus the medley at the end of it is very uh, it's just like fun like it's even at that point in their career where they were the biggest band creating like everything they touched was gold. They were not afraid to throw in half of an album as unfinished tunes that are just stitched together, which is impractical. Like people don't do the things like that now where they're like, okay, Hey, we just have like, imagine Taylor Swift, like one of the biggest acts in the world that every time she releases something, it's just like monstrous that half of it is a big mishmash of unfinished tunes that, weave in and out kind of a thing you'd be like yeah, I, I, when was the last time somebody did this <laughs> probably be like the 70s but yeah so that's probably why what about you oh, you're not you said you're not the biggest fan right i'm not a huge fan um but honestly probably revolution uh just the opening guitar sound and i love that story where they're plugging just directly into the console and they're just burning out channel strips Oh yeah, to get that distortion sound, um, uh, I, I I love that track. Um, absolutely, one of my favorites. That one is really really cool. They did a couple different versions too. They had the the one that made the record. And then there was like a. Have you heard the like the doo wop version? What? No. It's uh. So the one's called Revolution, and then I think it's Revolution One, like with the number after it, and it's very slow and it's like acoustic. Do do do. Say you want a revolution. <laughs> and then there's like literally like George and Paul do doo wops behind John. So it's it's like we're very 50s. Oh, that's that's funny. OK, mm -hmm. um, I always like to ask Beatles fans, how do you feel about the Rolling Stones? Oh, I, I love them. I, I they're totally different bands like. Uh, they they're not as polished. I feel like they're like much more of like, uh, even though the Beatles were a bar band, I feel like the, uh, the, it feels like the stones came up even more as a bar band in a way. I, I kind of view the Beatles in the similar camp as like Zeppelin, just like the opposite end of that pole mm -hmm. where they were like all very, very proficient to, uh, and like experts at what they did. And then it's more, it sounds just like like the Zeppelin would sound come across as a just a bl more bluesy bass thing. Um, 
but it's a lot more intelligent than you think it is uh, like initially once you start diving into what the music actually is and how the how everything's working together i feel that way about the beatles too so but the stones i love the stones they they were like and they're still kicking they're which is incredible <laughs> right yeah mm -hmm. yeah the stones i always felt and the thing is is like you technically you wouldn't have the stones without the beatles right because the, the way that i understand it is there was a there was a talent show and i forget which beetle it was but he was judging a talent show and one of the a r peeps who passed i think on the beatles was like hey is there a band out there that i should go see or check out and he said hey you should go check out the rolling stones and that a r rep literally got up out of the chair and went to go see them right then and there oh like, wow skipped out on his talent show performance duties of the day and went and just saw this band and signed them. Um, I would have to double check the authenticity of that story. But as I understand it, that is how they kind of got a big break. Um, cool. And it is to me, it's, it's a, uh, it is kind of apples and oranges. I just, I just like asking the question. Cause I know that uh, uh, there's a surprising amount of people that think that they're like at odds. And I'm just like, no man, they're, they're so different. Yeah. Um, people get triggered. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're like, Oh, like they, people I know who are big Beatles fans and sometimes they don't even like listen to the stones. And I'm like, well, why? <laughs> There's incredible stuff on those stones records. Um, I still think sympathy for the devil is one of the coolest tracks. Like, I know. Mm -hmm. And can you hear me knocking? Mm -hmm. Like just that opening guitar lick to go into that like vamp section. Yeah. After like the second course, I'm like, man, Give me um, shelter too. That's a that one rocks me. Okay, yeah. Um, if you want to get into some cool stone stuff, check out that Muscle Shoals documentary. They okay. recorded one of their uh, seminal records there, uh, okay. at Muscle Shoals, and they do some really cool. Uh, it's the one with Wild Horses. Oh right. Okay, yeah. When they were going a little more country. Yeah, because they. Okay, cool, cool. And they take this really cool story where Keith is just in the bathroom at Muscle Shoals with his guitar, and he just comes back with the guitar riff for wild horses. Jeez. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's so cool that uh, I, it's refreshing for me to get to talk to recording artists who are influenced by that type of music where there's so much in the details and you might not pick it up instantly, but there's so much there. And so for me, yeah. it's super refreshing to get to talk to someone else who kind of, you know, engages with music in that manner yeah yeah uh -huh, me too I, I i that's my favorite part of the old records is all those the details and the stories and legends and stuff of what how things were made all right so you've got this new record coming out um any plans to to tour on that record and and you know promote it yeah a big time so i have a lot more experience uh playing out than uh I do, even though recording is my favorite piece, it's like almost like a more elusive piece for me just because of the, I grew up gigging and had did a lot of that. So my brother is also a recording artist and um, he lives up in Duluth, Minnesota. His album actually comes out this Friday. So, um, which will be super cool, April 28th. So, uh, but yeah, he and I have uh, kind of set up a few shows this summer and then uh, we're going to meet, we're going all over the, midwest and i have some shows in um switzerland and things like that nature too i have just kind of like a handful of uh, uh pockets that in which i've made a bunch of connections with over the years but we're going to meet in our hometown and do a um a ticketed theater event and we're bringing up like we both are bringing up our whole bands and uh kind of meeting there in like a like a an evening with the Thorn Brothers kind of a style of event, which will be, I'm super stoked about. We haven't really gotten to do a lot of original stuff together. If we do, it's normally like I'll go in and sit in with a set um, and play just guitar or background vocals on his and vice versa. He'll come down um, to Nashville and um, we'll jam and do, he'll sit in for some shows kind of a thing. But um, to do like a full on uh, like little mini tour with uh, two acts is going to be, I'm really excited about that. That'll be fun. That so sounds like an absolute blast. June. Yeah. So hitting the road July and June, um, mixed bag of shows, doing uh, full band, acoustic, international. You're staying yep. busy. 
Yeah. Um, the summers are usually very busy for me from like June, July, August, September. I'm pretty slammed with, uh, gigs a lot of the times. Yeah. I am playing, uh, a festival in Switzerland in August that's called uh, the town is Baden and then they uh, funny enough like festival is fart in their language so it's Baden fart and uh, um, every five years they throw this festival and this is one of the years where it um, is hitting and this is the 100th anniversary of the first festival so I think it's going to be pretty bananas I guess like the, every other time I've gone there it's like a, a typical club like you know several hundred people in the room kind of a thing like it's very fun but i guess this festival is like people come through the whole time and it's like a million people end up passing through the festival so we'll uh i don't know i don't know what to expect it's going to be a blast in switzerland i was always like rocking they love love live music over there which is fun yeah that's one thing i've noticed significantly with promoting rock music specifically um it's been difficult the last 15 years to get rock music to stick in the states mm -hmm. uh, for, from my point of view and yeah, with with the bands that i've been a part of and it's hilarious that we're this small indie band that can't get on the radio here can't get print to notice us can't get anyone to talk to us so we're like, well, I mean, maybe we can just start sending press kits because this is this dates me. We sent press kits overseas to radio stations, to publications, and it blew up. And I'm like, what is happening? Yeah, um, we're featured in Classic Rock magazine next to like Aerosmith and the Rolling Stones. I'm like, what is happening? How is this? How is this work this way? And you know, when I've been releasing music lately, I've been on social media and I've been connecting directly with folks in Western Europe, uh, a ton of folks in, you know, uh, the UK, Germany, France, um, Sweden, Norway, and they are just thirsty for yeah. rock music. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Me too. They, they act like rock crowds over there too, which is, that's uh, just being so rooted in rock as well. Like uh, it... It, they just are like really you're right they are like very thirsty for it I, I think there's a lot of like djs and electronic stuff that is pretty big over there so when they do get the chance to experience like american based like roots types of things it's really like just there's a huge gap over there in the market for why that is I, I, or i don't know i don't know why that is but it's just kind of the way it is i guess well, it's interesting, too. When you look at the relationship between the U.S. and Western Europe when it comes to music, right? You know, they what happens after World War II? All of these blues records end up staying in the U.K. and Western Europe in these record shops because soldiers couldn't bring them back or whatever or, you know. And what does that do? That, directs, that directly sparks the British invasion, you know, mm -hmm. it just completely influences and it creates a different style of music. Uh, so it's it's really cool, that interesting uh, relationship between the U.S. and Western Europe. And, you know, you're seeing this with bands like the Cadillac Three or Blackstone Cherry, which are very Southern rock influenced uh, country on, on some levels. But, but, you know, Blackstone Cherry is a Kentucky based hard rock band. Yeah. And they'll play to a few thousand people here. But when they go overseas, they're selling out Royal Albert Hall like three nights in a row. You know, yeah. The Cadillac three. Yeah, it's nuts. That's crazy. I know. I uh, Are you familiar with Rival Sons? Oh, yeah. Very, they, very familiar. I, I'm a huge fan of theirs, too. And um, they have like that Zeppelin vibe. And I uh, grew up in a, um, a band that we actually covered a few uh, um, Blackstone Cherry tunes uh back in the day and yeah that that whole i remember listening to some interviews with uh the rival sons guys and they were saying how they would just go to where the people like their stuff and they just tried pretty much stopped touring in america in the first half of their career and they just would go over to europe for a couple months at a crack and then 
come back and do some shows, but I, it's it's kind of crazy that that's uh, the way that it goes. It, it also shows you like how much like culture really affects what people are into because there really isn't much of a difference between like the way that internet and promotions and things of that nature work overseas versus here. But um, for some reason, we're just into different things here right now which is uh, just is it's not good or bad it's just kind of the way it goes if you're into, if you're a rock and roller at least yeah the it's interesting and i love nerding out and getting into these cultural conversations and how you know music is affected or culture is affected by music or music affected by culture totally and then you add economics into that conversation as well um and i think over the last 10 years maybe 15 years that hip hop artists have become the new rock stars oh, totally. you know, mm -hmm. out of the, out of the mid nineties, right. You have this rejection of glam metal, right. And you have this really stripped down bear, which is honestly my favorite era of rock music, uh, huge Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, Mud Honey, Soundgarden. Mm -hmm. Um, you have that proficiency, but you also have that rawness. Oh yeah. Um, but what comes out of that, I think people call post grunge. And I think that you really start to get in a really boring place musically mm -hmm. um, where things just got super sterile for rock music. And what happened is, is mainstream rock music, I'm saying. And then insert incredibly authentic, bombastic, in your face characters, authentic or inauthentic hip-hop characters that come in and they're like wow this is this is the new rock star um, yeah and love it or hate it i mean I, i'm a fan um but it's interesting how that flip kind of flipped the script a little bit and now i think rock music is just now and i mean just now really kind of starting to climb its way back up the ladder mainly due to roots type style of rock music you know Absolutely. i think that it's accessible and it is completely the complete opposite of post grunge dirge. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I feel the same way. I love the, the rawness and things that are happening in rock music right now. Cause it's coming around. And, and even to your point about the, like the hip hop thing, it is, I find a lot of parallels between like the sixties and seventies eras of music with that because the the folk and rock and roll singers were the ones who were making like like political statements at that time back in the 60s and 70s and now that's like that is the baton is just in the hands of the hip-hop guys and girls and so that's like uh that's just really interesting how like if you and now i would say hip-hop probably is the biggest genre in the world i i, I would oh, think. hands down yeah and uh it just kind of goes hand in hand with like with the things that are the most influential. A lot of the times people are taking the, the biggest uh, like leaps and risks and they have like, they know where they uh, stand and, and they, a lot of the times they'll even put like philosophy and like more deeper things like Kendrick Lamar, for example, is like always like his stuff is like so heady, but also, you don't realize it until you get into it. And that's just like what's permeating culture, which is a good thing overall. I think that like really helps when art is more sophisticated. And that's like the base level of what people are listening to. It helps everybody's minds kind of expand a little bit. Yeah. What, what have you been listening to with rock stuff lately? Who's your some of the new stuff that you've been into? Oh, gosh. Um, not that they're new. But I do love that they've been w working with some bands from the 80s is I love the Struts. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. I, I think that I believe his name is Luke, the lead singer. I'm like, wow, this is this is this feels like Freddie Mercury to me. This feels like a modern take on Freddie Mercury. Absolutely. Um, not just tonally, but stylistically, the way that he operates on stage um it's fun it's it is a spectacle to see him on stage and he engages the crowd um i've really been into the struts i've really been into um 
you know what? I'm just gonna pull up my Spotify list. I'm not gonna lie about it. I've I've been crushing a lot of uh the latest like Jack White stuff. His album that came out last year it was it was like a double album that was super good. And then the uh um his band the Rack on Tours put out an album a few years ago. So the but I felt the same way, kind of what you were saying, a little bit of like a a modern spin on some retro stuff. Um, the Rack and Tours records and the Dead Weathers records, uh, love them. I absolutely mm -hmm. love them. I was never a big fan of the White Stripes. Um, I'm not saying because I completely respect what they did because that was like the rock band. It was like them and the Foo Fighters. That was like yeah. it. Um, I know. I mean, single-handedly, like walking rock music through a dark period. <laughs> yeah, it really uh, was. Um, gosh, I think I've just been in a complete like, not I'll call it a slump for new music. Um, I've been listening to a lot of older electronic stuff. So I've been listening to a lot of the first Massive Attack records. Um. I've been listening to a lot of early Nine Inch Nails. Oh, nice. Uh, and that kind of pushed me into like ministry and uh, even, you know, re-listening to like the Depeche Mode records. Cool. So that's where I've been living. And you know what? I think that that is a lesson that everyone should take away from this conversation is that don't just listen to one type of music. Consume everything that you can if you like it. And the only way you find out if you like it is if you experiment and you try new stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no guilty pleasures. If you, if you like it, just don't be guilty about it. Like, consume it. I, I, I totally agree. Even what like is your Taylor Swift stuff is one of mine. Like, their her production on Taylor Swift albums lately have been like very impressive. And I was like, oh, this is my wife listens to it quite a bit. And so then uh, she'll put it on and I, I, I'll just like notice some of the music of it and uh, be like, this is really good. And it sounds amazing. That is one that, uh, were you going to ask what some of the guilty pleasures of mine are? Yeah, the, 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 the non-guilty pleasure, guilty pleasures, because we would never call them guilty pleasures. But what would, what would your, what's your go-to guilty pleasure? Yeah, for me, it is, uh, man, I've been listening to, uh, I'm gonna look at my Spotify too. There you I, go. I, I've been really into a lot of like funk and stuff lately, like Parliament, you know? Oh yeah, Parliament. yeah, P-Funk, yeah. Taylor All day. the sucker, to the RuPaul the sucker. <laughs> that, that is probably one of my non-guilty, guilty pleasures. Um, and, oh, do you know, have you heard of the Bahamas? No, uh, I have not that this record sad hunk is one of mine that i've been super into it came out in 2020 and the guy's like he's I, I think he's like a diy guy like he produced the whole thing and um it's uh he's like this random canadian like middle-aged dude but the album is incredible and uh the songwriting's great the production is very like old beatles where like the bass will be paying hard left and the like the guitar over here and um but so uh that's one of my uh non-guilty guilty pleasures my favorite non-guilty pleasure guilty pleasure yeah spice girls spice girls all day long <laughs> that's amazing and here is why those songs, A, it is incredible pop music. I don't know yeah, what is. people, are, the English, I don't know what they do with their pop music, but it is just solid and it's catchy as hell. The production is great. Um, there's harmony because there's four women singing on this track. Um, like the song, uh, Too Much, the ballad. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, but there are some incredible songs on, on their two big records. And I actually saw them live in 97 or eight, I think. Oh, nice. They came through Nashville on, I guess like their one or two U S tours. Yeah. And they had a full band and I'm like, this is insane. That band is so on point. Um, and they did incredible. It was an absolute awesome show. 
Um, but yeah, the Spice Girls are an absolute, uh, you know, they're always on. I've got them on vinyl. That's how. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, you're in. <laughs> oh, in deep, uh, dude. I'm uh, in that vein of, of the guilty pleasure kind of thing. I've been listening to more Will Smith than I should, but in, a, in the best way possible. Dude. I mean, that's my childhood. So, yeah, same, same. I like, I, mean, uh, I was, well, cause it was, I've been into the old funk and soul stuff a lot lately. And then he sampled a lot of those things. So, like, he was sampling like some Stevie Wonder and, um, uh, I think with like Wild Wild West. And so, yeah. And then the, the, he had all of that like, uh, controversy last year with the, like the open face, open hand slap. And, uh, I, started like karaoke will smith right after that as just a joke just to be like socially funny like it like i would <laughs> people would be like oh is this gonna be bad and i was like he was ridiculous in that moment but i'm still gonna karaoke this song like this <laughs> this, this is fine and uh yeah that's uh that ended up kind of getting me on this whole like long pretty much like a guilty pleasure kind of like kick i'm like oh these are actually more fun than i remember them being the mid nineties was an absolute gem for pop music. And what's great. And I had a conversation with Jack and Jim Ivins who are, they're big guys here in the rock scene. Yeah. Uh, do, I think I know them. Yeah. They do the, um, grunge nights. Yeah. And we always banter back and forth on, um, usually on Twitter, but we had a really cool conversation about the mid nineties was an absolute pinnacle for, variety of music in popular chart topping music uh -huh. i mean you have things like the santana record you've got things like fastball you've got will smith jennifer lopez aguilera britney spears you eminem. Have all, eminem i mean mm -hmm. there is it was so incredibly diverse in the mid 90s that i don't think it'll ever be replicated again i mean it was in the top 100, I mean, just go back and look at any yeah. chart, any like top 100 chart from the mid 90s, and you will be amazed. And then you start going back and like, man, these songs are incredible. Like, uh -huh. It was a great era. It really was like that. Like it remind. That's another time that was like the ecosystem of music was as healthy as the 60s and 70s, because it was the diversity and the everybody was very like refined in their game, and it didn't matter what genre it was. It was like there are greats coming out all over the place, which yet. Yeah. So what's your take on that with like, you were saying that you're interested in like the culture of like how the culture and th and music influence each other. What's the difference between then and like something like now, I, I feel like we are getting into a healthier place now, but like, why does that happen? Um, well, I don't mean to sound like a crotchety old man, but you know, I think what happened in the 60s all the way up through, I would say the mid 90s, and that's where it stops, is you stop having these, and you're starting to have it again now, I guess, but you have these really interesting, geo-specific, highly localized scenes that were arguably not competitive, but they were mm -hmm. just switching band members out and creating new sounds and it was getting noticed and it got noticed without the, without the internet the internet didn't exist. Um, and that's one thing I, I, I miss most in that I, I see there's so much potential for, Yeah, but I don't know if it's the internet. I don't know if it's just, you know, economic competitiveness or what it is, but you know, you have these little, pockets of things like when Jimi hendrix leaves the u.s goes over to the uk and starts hopping in jam sessions with pete townsend and eric clapton and they're like well i can't play like that and right. it up to their game but they're all still cool they're all still friends um they're creating these really localized sounds and the same thing with um seattle seattle i mean that's mm -hmm. a, that is a case study for totally bands hopping in and out or uh hollywood los angeles in the 80s right like yeah, love yeah. it or hate it hair metal um you know we'll say it starts with van halen in 79 or 80 
that was such a localized type of music, but what do you get out of it, right? You get Van Halen, you get right. Guns N' Roses, you get some of the most incredible rock music ever made, but it was so localized. And the fact that Slash could not get into Poison, he auditioned for Poison and couldn't get in. Yeah. Right? So I like, didn't know that. That's crazy. I mean, granted, he did not look the part for Poison. And uh -huh. I mean, I'm so glad he did not make it into Poison. And I love CeCe DeVille. CeCe DeVille is the best guitar player for Poison ever. No one else could do it better. But then, you know, you have like, what is it? LA Guns and, you know, all of these other incredible acts coming out of that era that produced such incredible music, but it was because they were so localized. And I think that now, I think the pandemic may have shifted that a touch in a good way where people mm -hmm. have had to come, become more localized in their, you know, approach. Um, Nashville, where we are, is, is a little bit of an oddball, right? Because there's just so many musicians all the time that there's always overlap, but most places aren't like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that the internet as great as it's been for democratization and be able to get your music out there and connect directly with fans. I think that it has kind of taken away a little bit from that in-person communal vibe that you had with eras like grunge or sunset strip or, yeah. Um, you know, the Valley that we can't remember where you had like Linda Ronstadt and the Eagles and all those folks, same concept. I think yeah. that now we're in a place where that might be able to take off again. Uh, but I can only hope. Yeah. Um, I know. I, I think about that a lot because it's Nashville is an interesting case. We have the potential to like pretty much become a scene if we want to. It like and it's it's just at everybody's fingertips but yeah it is a it's an interesting blend the internet and the economic thing is in kind of an interesting uh combination because everything does get to be a little bit more competitive and art and competition don't always mesh together in the best way and uh sometimes if it is a little bit too much of a like it gets to be too much of a corporatized scene uh, sometimes it, everything becomes transactional, which is, you know, like, why, why would I just come over to your set and sit in like Jimi Hendrix would if I, if, you know, like, oh, I'm not getting paid for this. Why would I go catch? I got something I got to practice for that I'm going to get paid for. So I'm not going to go catch Chris's set, which that, that honestly was a bit more of what I was expecting when I moved here, that it would be like that. And it was, uh, um, so I try to support that as much as I can. Like when I, uh end up like have, have friends like playing sets just could to like go out and support music and just like have it be something that is fun but yeah that's it getting a localized scene is an interesting thing to like you can't fabricate it yourself it's just something that like happens and you got to be in the right place in the right time you know you bring up the one of my biggest issues and i don't have many issues i love nashville um, I'm a local. I was born here. Both mm. my parents were musicians, but my parents were jazz musicians, blues musicians. Yeah. That is all that is, is, Hey, we're sitting in, we're playing that tune in F, right? Oh, cool. Let's go. Yeah. So that's how I was brought up to engage with music. And when I got out playing live, it just blew my mind how negative I think people were to allow other folks to sit in and play or to, um, be a little more, you know, inclusive. communal with their approach and inclusive. Yeah. yeah. Um, now that, that happens, that happens, that, that probably happens every night on Broadway where people have, you know, mainly it's famous folks that come up, but, um, and sit in on, on songs. But I think it could be, it could be so much more, uh, cohesive and create so much more new music and new relationships if people were a little more open to that and i think it is i think it's based on an economic thing right um but even as you know i i make records as well and i hate having to think like well i can do this which is probably going to be more fun or i can do this which is going to sustain me economically you know i hate having to make those decisions and i feel like we have to make more and more of those as we move across time um, whereas I feel like the way that we record music, the way that music is consumed, all of those things kind of like 
compound in a really weird way. Yeah. Uh huh. So I agree. I agree. Yeah. The way that people do consume is, uh, it is interesting. And, and like, uh, even the way that labels operate and how they participate in scenes is like, like back when the eras that we've talked about, they would sign people to a couple album deals. Like they might not know what the outcome would be, but they're going to give you at least two to five albums. And now days that's just not necessarily how it works because of, giving uh like i guess the ability to just some degree give your music away at a much cheaper cost uh to the consumer which is great because you kind of get music accessible to across all demographics but then at the same note there's no money going in for the artist to make better music so it's it's kind of a catch-22 it's very interesting when you start unpacking uh the the economics tied in with music and and art in a way it's just you don't really think it's as impactful as it is you're like oh you just go sign a label deal and but it, everything shifts and is constantly evolving well yeah and then you have one thing that i don't think is discussed near enough and utilized probably at all anymore is artist development yeah yeah look at all of the incredible legends all of them had artist development now one of my favorites is you know, almost all the Motown artists, right? Yep. The Jackson Five is a great example. Those kids were trained. Now, granted, clearly there was talent there and people noticed that. But what made Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson arguably were those first years in Motown where he was taught how to talk to press, taught how to, you know, work with a band in the studio. Right choreography style like all of these things to help develop and another one that i don't think people understand is aretha franklin aretha franklin had flop after flop after flop yeah you know what made her they put her in the biggest studios in new york with the biggest songwriters and the biggest bands and budgets and they just could not break her well what do they do they send her down to muscle shoals and she just does her thing and then she finds herself. But could you imagine, like, I don't think that that could happen now. I don't think that a person would be given four to five failures or more right. to find themselves. But I think when that opportunity is given and allowed, you end up finding your Aretha Franklin's. You end up finding Ray Charles is another one who, yeah. I mean, people thought he was just like a, what, like a Nat King Cole, like tribute artist or whatever. And then when yeah. he was able to find himself, what do we get? We get Ray Charles. We get, you know, uh, all the incredible records he made. So I feel like there's a huge opportunity there for labels to get back into the artist development game mm -hmm. and make superstars again. Um, what I think what they've done is they've allowed other parties to do the artist development for them, and it can be subpar sometimes. Um, now, granted, you have your breakouts, right? Like Ariana Grande. Her artist development was essentially the Disney Channel. Uh -huh. Right? Right. Or um, who's another one? Oh, or like Kelly Clarkson, right? Her artist development was American Idol. Yeah. Um, now, not everyone is, turns into a Kelly Clarkson or an Ariana Grande, but um, I think what they're doing is they're letting the artist kind of tread water and try to develop themselves. But if you are good at anything it's really hard to develop yourself you get to a plateau where you need a mentor you need someone else to kind of look at or to kind of help guide you you i mean at different parts in your career you need guidance and different types of guidance uh-huh i think that that is a huge missed opportunity off of soapbox no 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 i i yeah, no, i i and i agree completely for sure because it's a uh... Yeah, that Aretha analogy is very interesting. Like the ability to swing and miss. And a lot of the times, like when it becomes so business heavy and it's like one and done, which is kind of how our culture is right now, it doesn't, uh, there isn't growth. And growth is a lot of the times where interesting things happen. Like the first Eagles record is kind of, they had a, they cut a couple tunes that were hits and if it wasn't for those tunes the eagles in today's day and age probably wouldn't have gotten 
a second album. Like if you listen to like the B sides on that for their the Eagles first album, it's just like surprising of where they were at. And then the, the same band would write Hotel California a few albums later. And um yeah, and that, that just comes from like allowing yourself to actually go in. And if I, I'm a huge uh like gardener and I have tons of plants and things like that. And if I just gave up every time like a plant just didn't meet my expectations i would probably have not that many plants because they they again like what i was talking about when i go out and road test some of my material i'm almost always surprised at what people resonate with and it's the same thing like with i mean the plants and like uh, music is a almost like a blossoming or any art form is a blossoming for like the human existence to me whereas you wouldn't get mad at the the plant for blossoming a little bit later in the growing season because it's still blossoming like you might have this one that blossomed first and then you have this one you're like well what this one is it sick is something wrong and you give it some attention and you give it some prep and make sure it's getting the proper like nutrients and sun and water and uh, like make sure it's like free of pests and then once once it's there you let it do its thing in the environment and it it grows just like other things do. And I, yeah, I, it is a hugely missed opportunity for it right now where people don't really have that chance to miss. And then they're creating things out of a sense of fear, which isn't, uh, it's not as, uh, you're not able to take as many risks and then less interesting things get made on a whole, which is, uh, it's, yeah, it's an interesting thing to unpack. It's not necessarily good or bad. It's just, that's kind of where we are. Awesome. Well, Garrett, thanks for, uh, being with me on the podcast today. This is my favorite part of the podcast where I get to talk to the guest and I get to ask them, what are three actionable items that you would give to someone in your shoes? So in your case, you're talking to another recording artist who is just getting started. What three pieces of advice would you give that person that they could go enact today? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. So the first thing I would think of would be to make sure that their approach to creating business out of uh, music is balanced. And I think we, a lot of people right now, there's not as much balance. Um, for example, I think there's a lot of trends where we depend heavily on the digital realm, like things like what we're doing right now or TikToks or um, Instagram and um, really leaning into the digital realm culture. And I think those, if I was an artist starting out right now, I would want to make sure that I'm balanced between my digital presence and my realm there and my physical presence, because you can be doing very well online, but you might not ever play shows. And in my experience, the there is more economic value a lot of the times to actually getting gigs and going out and playing shows. And I, I started doing those things from just calling people and cold calling. And I would go play the gigs that at some point you didn't, I didn't really want to play, but I was 24, 25 at that time. And now that I'm like uh, 31, I did those things seven years ago. And now that the, the fruits of that labor in the physical realm allow me to go to things like Switzerland for a couple of weeks or like, to have the context to do like theater shows and stuff like that. So that would be a good one. Don't go all in on either side. Don't be just in the physical realm and don't be just in the digital realm. Kind of find that uh, marriage between the two. Another piece of advice would be to always make time for your uh, practicing your fundamentals of things. Like don't, try to get super fancy with your technical abilities. Uh, just keep coming back to like a, essentials. I was a basketball player in college. And so every day we would practice dribbling and like, and we were, it, we played it, we made it to the um, NCAA tournament a couple of times. And like, I just take a lot of lessons from that to make sure that I'm always practicing the fundamentals of my craft. Um, Cause I think it comes out, you don't have to think about it when you finally do get that opportunity to play in front of a lot of people. Um, they come and they go, it's not like every single gig is going to be massive. And then if you do get that chance, you kind of have to be ready. And then thirdly, that 
nothing's really too good to be true. If you if you're seeing somebody else do something very cool that you wish that you would be able to be a part of, or you you know you have some of that maybe like imposter syndrome or um the just like watching somebody else like your peers maybe have more quote unquote success than you. But just keep in mind that every single thing that all of the, all of us are partaking in in the music industry there's a lot of labor and a lot of uh um stress and suffering that goes in with the joy and the beauty of making art so i think just keeping in mind that um no matter what path you're on because there isn't really a wrong path that just to make sure that that there is validity to all of the paths and that it's going to be just as much suffering for the person who's on a major world tour as there is for the uh, it's not just an easy cakewalk as it is for even somebody who's playing solo acoustic in clubs on their own with the uh, lonely. So you kind of uh, just know those things. Absolutely. Incredible advice. Garrett, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. And we will let everyone know when your next album is available and we will do our best to promote the hell out of it. So thanks again, Garrett. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. It was nice talking to you. And now a quick word from our sponsors. We all know the music business ain't easy, but it is simple. Learn exactly how simple making a plan can be from the connector, Chris Keaton. This award-winning song plugger, management consultant, recording academy and North Carolina Music Hall of Fame member can help you move the needle on your career. Email chris at chriskeaton.com or visit his website at www.chriskeaton.com for more information. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Do That Music Thing podcast. To learn more about me, the host, Christopher Faust, you can catch me online at christopherfaust.com, on Instagram at chrisfaustmusic, or on Twitter at Chris James GTR. If you'd like to be a guest on the Do That Music Thing podcast, please feel free to email me at chrisfaustmusic at gmail.com. If you're a fan of the show, head on over and leave us a five-star review. Thanks for listening. I'm Chris Faust. Let's go do that music thing.